Alright guys, so we're back with Continuing Into the Wild uh, by John Krakauer. Um, quick recap uh, from the chapters that we read last week. Both chapters were actually a personal story by the author of the book, um, talking about his own experiences that are similar to our main character of this book. Um, so basically, if we remember, we can recall, he was in Alaska actually climbing a really challenging mountain, and he had a lot of um, close brushes with his own potential death. So he was just kind of drawing connections between how easy it was for someone in Chris McCandless's position to um, also, you know, be hurt and inevitably die the way that he did. Um, obviously, the author, despite those close calls, did not. Um, but we are now continuing on to chapter 16. Um, this chapter is titled The Alaska Interior. On April 15th, 1992, Chris McCandless departed Carthage, South Dakota in the cab of a Mack truck hauling a load of sunflower seeds. His great Alaskan odyssey was underway. Three days later, he crossed the Canadian border at Rootsville, British Columbia, and thumbed through North uh, Shookamuck and Radium Junction, Lake, Lake Louise and Jasper, Prince George and Dawson Creek, where in the town center he took a snapshot of the sing spot marking uh, the signpost, excuse me, marking the official start of the Alaska Highway. Mile zero, the sign reads. Fairbanks, 1,523 miles. Hitchhiking tends to be difficult on the Alaska Highway. It's not unusual on the outskirts of Dawson Creek to see a dozen or more doeful looking men and women standing along the shoulder with extended thumbs. Some of them may wait a week or more between rides, but McCandless experienced no such delay. On April 21st, just six days out of Carthage, he arrived at Liard River Hot Springs at the threshold of the Yukon Territory. There is a public campground at Liard River for, from which a boardwalk leads half a mile across a marsh to a series of natural thermal pools. It is the most popular way to stop on the Alaska Highway, and McCandless decided to pause there for a soak in the soothing waters. When he finished bathing and attempted to catch another ride north, however, he discovered that his luck had changed. Nobody would pick him up. Two days after arriving, he was still at Liard River, impatiently going nowhere. At 6, 6.30 on a brisk Thursday morning, the ground still frozen hard, Gaylord Stuckley walked out to the boardwalk of one of the largest pools, expecting to have the place to himself. He was surprised, therefore, to find somebody already in the steamy water, a young man who introduced himself as Alex. Stuckley, bald and cheerful, a ham-faced 63-year-old hooser, was en route from Indiana to Alaska to deliver a new motorhome to a Fairbanks RV dealer, a part-time line of work in which he dabbled since retiring after 40 years in the restaurant business. He told McCandless that his destination, oh, excuse me, he told McCandless his destination, and the boy exclaimed, hey, that's where I'm going too, but I've been stuck here for a couple days now, trying to get a lift. Do you mind if I ride with you? Oh, Jiminy, he replied. I'd love to, son, but I can't. The company I work for has a strict rule against picking up hitchhikers, and it can get me fired. As he chatted with McCandless through the sulfurous mist, though, Stuckley began to reconsider. Alex was a clean shaven and Alex was clean shaven and had short hair, and I could really tell by the language he used that he was a sharp fella. He wasn't the type that you call a typical hitchhiker. I'm usually leery of them. I figure there's probably something wrong with the guy if he can't even afford a bus ticket. So anyway, after about half an hour, I said, I'll tell you what, Alex. The art is a thousand miles from Fairbanks. I'll take you 500 miles as far as Whitehorse, and you'll be able to get a ride the rest of the way from there. Excuse me. A day and a half later, however, when they arrived in Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon Territory and the largest, most cosmopolitan town on the Alaskan Highway, Stuckley had come to enjoy McCandless's company so much that he changed his mind and agreed to drive the boy the entire distance. Alex didn't come out and say too much at first, Stuckley reports, but this is a, but it's a long, slow drive. We spent a total of three days together in those washboard roads, and by the end of, end, excuse me, and by the end, he kind of let his guard down. 
I'll tell you what, and he was a dandy kid, real courteous, and he didn't even cuss or use a lot of the slang. You could tell he came from a nice family. Mostly he talked about his sister. He didn't get along with his folks too good, I guess. He told me his dad was a genius, a NASA rocket scientist, but he'd been a bigamist at one time, and that kind of went against Alex's grain. Said he hadn't seen his parents in a couple years since he graduated college. McCandless was candid with Suckley about his intent to spend the summer alone in the bush, living off the land. He said it was something he wanted to do since he was little, says Stuckley. Stucky, sorry, I keep mispronouncing the name. Uh, he said that he wanted to, he didn't want to see a single person, no airplanes, no sign of civilization. He wanted to prove to himself that he could make it on his own without anybody's help. Stucky and McCandless arrived in Fairbanks on the afternoon of April 25th. The older man took the boy to a grocery store where he bought a bag of rice, and then Alex said that he wanted to go out to the university to study up on what kind of plants he could eat. Berries and things like that. I told him, Alex, you're too early. There's no two foot, uh, there's still two foot, three foot of snow on the ground, and there's nothing growing yet. But his mind was pretty well made up. He was champing at the bit to get out there and start hiking. Stucky drove to the University of Alaska campus on the west end of Fairbanks and dropped McCandless off at 5.30 p.m. Before I let him out, Stucky says, I told him, Alex, I've driven, a th driven you a thousand miles. I've fed, fed you and fed you for three straight days. The least you could do is send me a letter when you get back from Alaska, and he promised that he would. I also begged and pleaded with him to call his parents. I can't imagine anything worse than having a son out there and not knowing where he's at for years and years not knowing whether he's living or dead. Here's my credit card number, I told him. Please call them. But all of this said was, maybe I will and maybe I won't. After he left, I thought, oh, why didn't I get his parents' phone number and call them myself? But everything just kind of happened so quick. After dropping McCain at the university, Stucky drove into the town to deliver the RV to the appointed dealer, only to be told that the person responsible for checking the new vehicles had already gone home for the day. It wouldn't be back until Monday morning leaving him stuck for two days to kill in Fairbanks before he could fly home to Indiana. On Sunday morning, with time on his hands, he returned to the campus. I hoped to find Alex and spend another day with him, take him on sightseeing or something. I looked for a couple hours, drove all over the place, but I didn't see, uh, see but didn't see hide or hair of him. He was already gone. After leave, taking his leave of Taking his leave of Stuckley on Saturday evening, McCandless spent two days and three nights in the vicinity of Fairbanks, mostly at the university. In the campus bookstore, tucked away at the bottom, on the bottom shelf of the Alaska section, he came across a scholarly, exhaustively researched field guide to the region's edible plants. Uh, this is a bit of a hard one to read. It's all in uh, Latin. It's called uh, Tenena Plantore Tenaina Keteuna, and it's in Ethnobotany, <laughs> Ethnobotany of the Denaina Indians of South Central Alaska. It was written by Priscilla Russell Carey. From a postcard rack near the cash register, he picked out two cards of a polar bear, one of which he sent his final messages to Wayne Westerberg and Jan Burns from the university post office. Pursuing, perusing the classified ads, McCandless found a used gun to buy, the semi-automatic 22 caliber Remington with a 4x20 times scope and a plastic stock. The model called the Nylon 66, no longer in production, it was a favorite by, a, by Alaska troopers because of its lightweight and reliability. He closed the deal in the parking lot, probably paying around $125 for the weapon and then purchased 400 um, four 100 round boxes of hollow point uh, long rifle shells from a nearby gun shop. At the conclusion of his preparations in Fairbanks, McKinless loaded up his pack and started hiking west from the university. Leaving the campus, he walked past the Geophysical Institute, a tall glass and concrete building capped with a large satellite dish. The dish, one of the most distinctive landmarks on the Fairbanks skyline, had been erected to collect data from satellites equipped with synthetic aperture radar of Walt McCandless's design. Walt had in fact visited Fairbanks during the startup of, receiving, of the receiving station and had gotten some of the software crucial to its operation. If the Geophysical Institute prompted Chris to think of his father as he tramped by, the boy left no record of it. 
Four miles west of town, in the evening's deepening chill, McCandless pitched his tent on a patch of frozen hard ground surrounded by birch trees, not far from the crest of a bluff overlooking Gold Hill and Gold Hill Gas and Liquor. Fifty yards from his camp was the terraced road cut of the George Parks Highway, the road that would take him to Stampede Trail. He woke early on the morning of April 28th, walked down to the highway into the pre-dawn gloaming, and was pleasantly surprised when the first vehicle to come along pulled over to give him a lift. It was a gray Ford pickup with a bumper sticker on the back that declared, I fish, therefore I am, Petersburg, Alaska. The driver of the truck, an electrician on his way to Anchorage, wasn't much older than McCandless. He said his name was Jim Galian. Three hours later, Galian returned his truck turned his truck west off the highway and drove as far as he could down an unplowed side road. When he dropped McCandless off at Stampede Trail, the temperature was in the low 30s. It would drop into the low teens at night, and a foot and a half of crusty spring snow covered the ground. The boy could hardly contain his excitement. He was, at long last, about to be alone in the vast Alaska wilds. He would, as he trudged expectantly down a trail in a fr fake fur parka, his rifle slung over one shoulder, the only food McCandless carried was a 10-pound bag of long grain rice and, a two and two sandwiches and a bag of corn chips that Galen had contributed. A year earlier, he'd subsisted for more than a month beside the Gulf of California on five pounds of rice and a bounty of fish caught with a cheap rod and reel, an experience that made him confident he could harvest enough food to survive an extended stay in the uh, Alaska wilderness as well. The heaviest item in McCandless's half-full backpack was his library. Nine or ten paper-bound books, most of which had been given to him by Jan Burrs in Nyland. Along these among these volumes were titles by Thoreau and Tolstoy and Goggle, but McCandless was no literary snob. He simply carried what he thought he might enjoy reading, including mass market books by Michael Crichton, Robert Persig, and Louis Lamour. Having neglected the, to pack writing paper, he began a, a laconic journal on some blank pages in the back of the Tantiana Ta. I'm sorry, I'm having so much trouble with these Latin words. Tanena plant, uh, plant lore. The Healy Triminus of the Stampede Trail was traveled by a handful of dog mushers, ski towers, and snow machine enthusiasts during the winter months, but only until the frozen rivers began to break up in late March and early April. By the time McCandless headed into the bush, there was open water flowing on most of the larger streams, and nobody had been very far down the trail for at least two or three weeks. Only the faint remnants of packed snow machine track remained for him to follow. McCandless reached the river his second day out. Although the banks were lined with a jagged, ha with a jagged shelf of frozen overflow, no icebergs spanned the channel of open water, so he was forced to wade. There had been a big thaw in early April, April and breakup had come early in 1992, but the weather had turned cold again, so the river's volume was quite low when McCandless crossed, probably thigh deep at most, allowing him to splash to the other side without difficulty. He never suspected that in doing so, he was crossing his Rubicon. To McCandless's inexperienced side, there was nothing to suggest that two months hence, as the glaciers and snowfields at the, at the Thakalanika's headwater thawed in the summer heat, its discharge would multiply nine or ten times in volume, transforming the river into a deep, violent torrent that bore no resemblance to the gentle brook he blithely waded across in April. From his journal, we know that on April 29th, McCandless fell through the ice somewhere. It, was, it probably happened as he traversed a series of melting beaver ponds just beyond the Taklanika's western bank, but there is nothing to indicate that he suffered any harm to the mishap. A day later, as the trail crested at a ridge, he finally got his first glimpse of Mount McKinley's high, blinding, white bulwarks, and a day after that, May 1st, some 20 miles down the trail from where he'd stopped, been stopped by, was, excuse me, down the trail from where he was dropped off by Galian, he stumbled upon the old bus beside the Sushana River. It was outfitted with a bunk and a barrel stove, and previous visitors had left the improvised shelter stocked with matches, bug dope, and other essentials. Magic bus day, he wrote in his journal. He decided to lay over for a while in the vehicle and take advantage of its crude comforts. 
He was elated to be there. Inside the bus, on a sheet of weather plywood spanning the broken window, the canvas scrawled an excellent declaration of independence. Two years, he walks the earth. No phone, no pool, no pets, no cigarettes. Ultimate freedom, an extremist. An atheistic voyage whose home is the road. Escape from Atlanta, thou shalt not return, cause the West is the best. And now after rambling years comes the final and greatest adventure. The climactic battle to kill the false being within a ver and victoriously co collude the spiritual revolution. Ten days and nights of freight trains and hitchhiking bring them to the great white north. No longer to be poisoned by civilization he flees and walks alone upon the land to become lost in the wild. Signed, Alexander, Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. Reality, however, was quick to intrude on McCainless's revere. He had difficulty killing game, and the daily journal entries during his first week in the bush include weakness, snowed in, and disaster. He saw but did not shoot at a grizzly on May 2nd, shot at but missed some ducks on May 4th, and finally killed and ate a spruce goose on May 5th, but he didn't shoot anything else until May 9th when he bagged a small squirrel, by which point he had written Fourth Day Famine in the journal. But, there, but soon thereafter, his fortunes took a sharp turn for the better. By mid-May, sun was circling high in the heavens, flooding the Tago with light. The sun dipped below the northern horizon for fewer than four hours out of every 24 hour, um, and at midnight, the sky was still bright enough to read by. Everywhere but the north-facing slopes and the shadowy ravines, the snowpack had melted down to bare ground, exposing the previous season's rose hips and lingon lingonberries, which McCainless gathered and ate in great quantity. He also became much more successful at hunting game and for the next six weeks feasted regularly on squirrel, spruce goose, duck, goose, and porcupine. On May 22nd, a crown fell off one of his molars, but the event didn't seem to dampen his spirits much, because the following day he scrambled up the nameless hump-like hump 3,000 foot buttle that rises directly north of the bus, giving him a view of the whole icy sweep of his Alaska range um, in mile after mile of uninhabited country. His journal entry for the day is characteristically terse but unmistakably joyous, Climb Mountain. McCandless had told Galeon that he intended to remain on the move during the stay in the bush. I'm just going to take off and keep walking west, he said. I might walk all the way to the Bering Sea. On May 5th, after pausing for four days of the bus, he resumed his preambulation. From the snapshots recovered with his Minolta, it appears that McCandless lost or unintentionally left uh, the by now distinct, the indistinct Stampede Trail and headed west and north through the hills above the Sushana River, hunting game as he went. It was slow going, in order to feed himself, he had to devote a large part of each day stalking animals. Moreover, as the ground thawed, the route returned to a gauntlet of boggy muskeg and in, uh, impenetrable alder, and McCandless uh, belatedly came to appreciate none of one of the fundamental, if counterintuitive, axioms of the North. Winter, not summer, is the preferred season for traveling uh, overland through the bush. Faced with the obvious folly of his original ambition to walk 500 miles to Tidewater, he reconsidered his plans. On May 19th, having traveled no farther west than the Tolkat River, less than 15 miles beyond the bus, he turned around. A week later, he was back at the derelict vehicle, apparently without regret. He decided that the, that the Sushana drainage was plenty wild to suit his purposes and that Fairbanks bus 142 would make a fine base camp for the remainder of the summer. Ironically, the wilderness surrounding the bus, the patch of overgrown country where McCandless was determined to become lost in the wild, scarcely qualifies as Alaska wilderness, as wilderness by Alaska standards. Less than 30 miles to the east is a major thoroughfare, the George Parks Highway. Just 16 miles to the south, beyond an escapement of the outer range, hundreds of tourists ramble daily into Denali Park over a road patrolled by the National Park Service. And unbeknownst to the uh, atheistic, atheistic voyager scattered within a six-mile radius of the bus 
are four cabins, although none happened to be occupied during the summer of 1992. But despite the relative proximity of the bus to civilization for all practical purposes, McCandless was cut off from the rest of the world. He spent nearly four months in the bush, all told, and during that period he didn't encounter another living soul. In the end, the Sushana River site was sufficiently remote to cost him his life. It was in the last week of May, after moving his few possessions into the bus, McCandless wrote a list of housekeeping chores on a paper mache like strip of birch bark. Collect the store ice from the river uh, for refrigerating meat. Cover the vehicle's missing windows with plastic. Lay in a supply of firewood. Clean the accumulation of ash from the stove. Uh, and under the heading, long term, he drew up a list of more ambitious tasks like map the area, improvise a bathtub, collect skins and feathers to sew into clothing, construct a bridge across a nearby creek, repair mess kit, blaze a network of hunting trails. The diary ent entries following his return to the bus catalog a bounty of wild meat on May 28th, gourmet duck, June 1st, five squirrels. June 2nd, porcupine, uh, ptarmigan, four squirrels, gray bird. June 3rd, another porcupine, four squirrels, two gray bird, and an ash bird. June 4th, a third porcupine, squirrel, gray bird. On June 5th, he shot a Canada goose as a big Christmas turkey. Then, as big as a Christmas turkey, excuse me. Then on June 9th, he bagged the biggest prize of all. Moose, he recorded in the journal. Overjoyed, the proud hunter took a photograph of himself kneeling over his trophy, rifle thrust triumphantly over his head, his features distorted in a rictus of ecstasy and amazement, like some unemployed janitor uh, who'd gone to Reno and won a million dollar jackpot. Although McCandless was enough of a realist to know that hunting game was an unavoidable component of living off the land, he had always been ambivalent about killing animals. That ambivalence turned to remorse soon after he shot the moose. It was relatively small, weighing perhaps 600 or 700 pounds, but nevertheless, it amounted to a huge quantity of meat. Believing that it was morally indefensible to waste any part of the animal that has been shot for food, McCandless spent six days toiling to preserve what he had killed before it spoiled. He butchered the carcass under a thick cloud of flies and mosquitoes, boiled the organs into a stew, and then laboriously excavated a burrow in the face of the rocky stream bank directly below the bus in which he tried to cure by smoking the uh, immense slabs of purple flesh. Alaskan hunters know that the easiest way to preserve meat in the bush is to slice it into thin strips and then air dry it to a makeshift, on a makeshift rack. But McCandless, in his naivete, relied on the advice of hunters he consulted in South Dakota, who, had who advised him to smoke his meat, not an easy task on the under the circumstances. Butchery and extremely difficult, he wrote in the journal on June 10th, fly mosquito hordes, remove intestines, liver, kidneys, one lung, steaks, get hindquarters and leg to stream. June 11th, remove heart and another lung, two front legs and head, Get rest to stream, haul near cave, try to protect the smoker. Uh, June 12th, remove half rib cage and stakes, can only work nights, keep smokers going. June 13th, get remainder of rib cage, shoulder and neck to cave, start smoking. June 14th, maggots all ready. Smoking, paper, smoking appears ineffective, don't know, looks like disaster. I now wish I'd never shot the moose, one of the greatest tragedies of my life. At that point, he gave up on preserving the bulk of the meat and abandoned the carcass to the wolves. Although he castigated himself severely for the waste of life he'd taken, a day later, McCandless appeared to regain some perspective. For his journal notes, henceforth will learn to accept my errors, however great they be. Shortly after the moose episode, McCandless began to read Thoreau's Walden. In the chapter titled Higher Laws, in which Thoreau ruminates on the morality of eating, McCandless highlighted, when I had caught and cleaned and cooked and eaten my fish, they seemed to not have fed me essentially, and it was insignificant and unnecessary to cost more than it came to. The moose, McCandless wrote in the margin, and in the same package passage, he marked, the repugnance to animal food is not the effective experience, but is an instinct. It appeared more beautiful to live low and fare hard in many respects, 
and though I never did so, I went far enough to please my imagination. I believe that every man who has ever been earnest to preserve his higher or poetic faculties in the best condition has been particularly inclined to abstain from animal food and from uh, much food of any kind. It's hard to provide and cook so simple and clean a diet as will not offend the imagination, but this, I think, is to be fed when we feed the body. We should both sit down at the same table, yet perhaps this may be done. The fruits eaten temporarily need not make us ashamed of our appetites, nor uh, interrupt the worthiest pursuits, but put an extra condiment into your dish and it will poison you. Yes, McCandless wrote, and two pages later, consciousness of food, eat and cook with concentration, holy food. On the back of pages of the book that served as his journal, he declared, I am reborn. This is my dawn. Real life has just begun. Deliberate living, conscious attention to the basics of life and a constant attention to your immediate environment and its concerns. Example, a job, a task, a book. Anything requiring efficient concern, circumstance has no value and how will one, it is how one relates to a situation that has the value. All true meaning resides in the personal relationship to a phenomenon, what it means to you. The great holiness of food, the vital heat, positivism, the inter, uh, interpassable joy of the life uh, um, aesthetic, absolute truth and honesty, realty, independence, finality, stability, consistency. As Michaelis gradually stopped rebuking himself for the waste of the moose, the commitment to that began in mid May, uh, excuse me, uh, the contentment that began in mid-May resumed and seemed to continue through early July. Then in the midst of this idol came the first two pivotal setbacks. Satisfied apparently with what he had learned during his two months of solitary life in the wild, McCainless decided to return to civilization. It is time to bring his final and greatest um, adventure to a close and get himself back to the world of men and women where he could chug a beer, talk philosophy, and thrall strangers with tales of what he'd done. He seemed to have moved beyond his need to assert so adamantly his autonomy, his need to separate himself from his parents. Maybe he was prepared to forgive their imperfections. Maybe he was even pre prepared to forgive some of his own. McCandless seemed ready, perhaps, to go home. Or maybe not. We can do mo no more than speculate about what he intended to do after he walked out of the bush. There is no question, however, that he intended to walk out. Riding on a piece of birch bark, he made a list of things to do before he departed. Patch jeans, shave, organize pack. Shortly thereafter, he propped up his Minolta on an empty oil drum and took a snapshot of himself, brandishing a yellow disposable razor and grinning at the camera, clean shaven, with new patches cut from the army blanket stitched onto the knees of his filthy jeans. He looks healthy and alarmingly gaunt. Already, his cheeks are sunken. Uh, the tendons on his neck stand out like a uh, like taut cables. On July 2nd, McCandless finished reading Tolstoy's Family Happiness, marked, uh, having marked several pa passages that moved him. He was right in saying that the only certain happiness in life is to live for others. I have lived through much, and now I think I have found what is needed for happiness. A quiet, secluded life in the country, with the possibility of being useful to people to whom it is easy to do good, and who are not accustomed to have it done to them. Then work, uh, which one hopes may be of some use. Then rest, nature, books, music, love for one's neighbor. Such is my idea of happiness, and then on top of that, you for a mate, and children perhaps. What more can the heart of a man desire? Then, on July 3rd, he shouldered his backpack and began the 20-mile hike to the Im, uh, Improved Road. Two days later, halfway there, he arrived in the heavy rain at the beaver ponds that blocked access to the west bank of the Teklanika River. In April, they had been froze over and hadn't presented an obstacle. Now he must have been alarmed to find the three-acre lake covering the trail. To avoid having to wade through the murky, chest-deep water, he scrambled uh, up a steep hillside, bypassed the ponds in the north, and then dropped back down to the river at the mouth of the gorge. <laughs> 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 
when he'd first crossed the river six, uh, 67 days earlier in the freezing temperatures of April, it had been icy but gentle knee-deep creek. He had simply strolled across it. On July 5th, however, the Tequanica was a full flood, swollen with rain and snowmelt from glaciers in the high Alaska range, running cold and fast. If he could reach the far shore, the remainder of the hike to the highway would be easy, but to get there, he would have to negotiate a channel with some hun that was some hundred feet wide. The water, opaque with glacial sediment and only a few degrees warmer than the ice that had recently been, was the color of wet concrete. Too deep to wade in, it rumbled like a freight train. The powerful current would quickly knock him off his feet and carry him away. Michaelis was a weak swimmer and had confessed to several people that he was in fact afraid of the water. Attempting to swim the numbingly cold torrent or even to paddle some sort of improvised raft across seemed too risky to consider. Just downstream from where the trail met the river, the Teklanika erupted into a chaos of boiling white water as it accelerated through the narrow gorge. Long before he could swim or paddle to the far shore, he'd been pulled in uh, he'd be pulled into the rapids and drowned. In his journal, he wrote, Disaster, reined in, river look impossible, lonely, scared. He concluded correctly that he would, have, he would probably be swept to his death if he attempted to cross the Tequanica at uh, that place in those conditions. It would be suicidal. It was not simply an option. If Michaelis had walked a mile or so upstream, he would have discovered that the river uh, broadened into a maze of braided channels. If he'd scouted carefully by trial and error, he might have found a place where these braids were only chest deep. As strong as the current would be running, it would have clearly knocked him off his feet. But, uh, but by dog paddling and hopping along the bottom as he drifted downstream, he could have conceivably made it across before being carried into the gorge or succumbing to hypothermia but it would have been very risk, a very risky proposition, and at that point, McCandless had no reason to take such a risk. He'd been fending for himself quite nicely in the country. He probably understood that if he was patient and waited, the river eventually would drop to a level where it could be safely forded. After weighing his options, therefore, he settled on the most prudent course. He turned around and began walking west back towards the bus, back into the fickle heart of the bush. All right, and that is the end of chapter 16. It's a bit of a longer chapter, but as you can see, we are getting very close to the end. Um, we're actually kind of connecting the dots of what we learned at the beginning of the story about Chris. So uh, I'll pick this up later this week. Until next time, bye.